sharing a screen here. Okay. Are we set with the recording? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, so take two. Right, so uh, yes, this afternoon we're talking about deduplication in CIVI. <laughs> I'm a source of Spiffle Consulting, Consulting, which means I spend much of my time playing with Civi one way or another. So, duplicates. So, what are they? And uh, fairly basically, they are multiple contact records for the same real life person or organization or household, if you happen to use them. And uh, where do they come from? Well, they get created in various different ways. So they might be created manually, so simply that somebody has entered another record and they just didn't know one already existed because they didn't search for one or the information they had didn't bring up what they were looking for. Or alternatively come from forms that we've got on the website. So whether that's for an event sign up, um, or a membership or a donation, or maybe sign up to a newsletter, we're asking for a bit of information which is going to go either onto an existing contact record or onto a new one. And uh, it's all down to quite how we have various bits of the system configured as to what happens there. But that's one of the sources. Um, or alternatively, it may come when we import data from an external system somewhere. So do they matter? Um, before we spend too much time trying to clean them all up, the question is, you know, does it matter? Um, and is it a big problem? Well, the good news is that they're not going to blow up your system. So just because you've got some duplicates there, they're not going to cause major issues. And it's very common that if you look at a system, you'll find there are some duplicates. But uh, it's not a good state to be in because it gives you, it, it causes confusion. So you think you found somebody's record and it tells you, for example, that they are a member but it doesn't show you their event registration because somehow that event registration has shown up on a different contact record. And if you went to look at the other one, you'd see that, yes, they signed up the event, but you didn't have details of their membership. So it's confusing when you try and use the system and you end up with this sort of incomplete data. Um, if you're doing stats out of the system, you'll very probably end up with some misleading stats because you're counting people twice or maybe you're not counting them properly or whatever else. So you do want to do what you can to get rid of them, uh, but equally, they're not the end of the world. So how do we avoid them in the first place? So along the sort of prevention is better, better than cure approach, then one of the ways we can, we can avoid them occurring in the first place is by asking people to use to, to sign in first before they do a form for something. So once they're signed in, we know who they are. We know exactly which contact record we're talking about and any further data they enter will go onto that existing contact record. And that's probably the, 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 the most reliable way of making sure that you're not getting a duplicate. But that's not always possible or desirable. Um, a second approach you can do is sending emails with a checksum link. So this is where I'm going to ask someone, uh, one of you who would like to, to turn your mic back on and explain to us what a checksum link is all about. Any volunteers? anyone are you out there i'm out here so i'll, I'll see if i Go can on. answer Go that <laughs> <laughs> i was hoping somebody else might pipe up first but. so the the checksum link is a a unique link that uh, allows the user to click on that link and it logs them in um with their user record so that it's who already know who's um, filling in the form before they um, complete the form. Thank you. Yes, exactly. 
<clears throat> so it's so when we send a mail out from Civi Mail, we can include this checksum token, uh, which means when they click on that, it it knows which record that's associated with, and again it then means that we're updating the right record. Um, <clears throat> there are limitations to that, so the checksum links only work for a certain period of time, so typically two weeks or so, depends how you can, what you configure them to. Um, and it's it, it's not perfect, but uh, it's it's certainly one of the ways of avoiding these these duplicates. Uh, and then the other way that we avoid them is by configuring these dedupe rules. Uh, and we're going to talk a whole lot more about the dedupe rules um, as we go along. And the dedupe rules kick into play, um, meaning that when somebody fills in a form, then it's these DG rules that we're looking at to determine whether or not it matches an existing um, an existing contact. So how do we get rid of them? Well, what we don't do is just delete them. If we just find them and delete them, then typically we're going to lose a bit of data because um, normally they've been created for some purpose and they've got some activity or some piece of information that's, that's that's recorded against it and so we don't want to do that and we do want instead to merge them and a couple of ways we can go about that so one is is the like the, the ad hoc merge so when we do a search and uh, we get a search results screen there's an actions button there and if we select two contacts from that list and go to the merge uh, we'll have a look at this in a minute uh, then you'll see that you can uh, you can do that uh, that merge <clears throat> just on those two contacts. The other approach is that we do this dedupe process, where we uh, more actively go and search for duplicates, and then decide quite what we're going to merge. Uh, I should probably explain for those outside the UK that symbol down there is a road, UK road traffic symbol meaning lanes are merging. <clears throat> so what's a DJ rule? Well, it determines whether a pair of contacts match. So which fields are we considering? And um, that's really all they're trying to do is to say, so what do you mean? when you say this is a duplicate. Uh, and obviously you can only look at the data you've actually got there. So we have to be slightly careful with these things. Um, and what a good rule looks like huh, is going to depend on your data and how you use it. So if, for example, um, <clears throat> you know, a, a common one that we use is an email address. Well, that's fine, except one organization that I deal with, not all of their members have email. So that's not useful because it's just blank. <clears throat> um, it is sometimes we do stuff based on address. But if you're not collecting the address and you've only got email addresses, then an address based one isn't going to be useful for you. So it does depend what your data is. Um, um, as to quite how you can, you know, what, what is going to be an effective rule for you. The rules can get used in, in two distinct ways. So if we've got the case it is here where we've got an admin who is searching for these duplicates, the actual decision in terms of whether or not um, it is truly a duplicate, whether it, whether these two records actually represent the same person is going to be made by a human. And that's that's a, that's a supervised um, thing. Whereas if we fill in a form, the, the decision as to whether or not uh, the, that the new data, the form data correctly matches uh, an existing contact is decided by the system. And that's unsupervised. And so when we look at the, the GUI, you'll see that uh, there is there is a supervised rule and an unsupervised rule. And <coughs> these get used um, in, in, in you know, 
particular situations. Um, but making sure that your your rule is correct or your rules there are correct and useful for your data is quite an important thing. Quick warning here. It's fairly easy to merge two records that represent one real person into one. That's okay. But if you've got one record that has a mix of different details that actually is representing two different real people, then you get in a mess and that's difficult and you need to know much more about you know, those individuals or track back through logs or whatever else. So you, you wanna be um, cautious on these things to make sure that you're not being too um, yeah, too keen in terms of going, ah, yes, 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 I'm sure this, is, this will be the same person um, because you know, then, then you get in more of a mess trying to sort that out. So yeah, as I say, just uh, be, be cautious of that one. And think carefully about your unsupervised rule. So the default one is just an email address. And <clears throat> uh, often that works quite well. Um, but one situation where that doesn't is if you have, uh, sometimes you have a, a couple or even a family who will share an email address. And if they're sharing that email address and the only thing that you're looking at is email address, and that's your default and supervised rule, then you potentially are getting a, you know, um, a combination of different people coming onto that same record, um, at which point you're going to want to, to do something about that. So, DG rules. How are they defined? Well, they're pretty straightforward, <coughs> at least for a start. And they consist of up to five fields. Um, and each item, uh, each part of that, that rule, we can specify a length and a weight associated with the field. And then overall, there's a threshold. Um, that'll make a little bit more sense when we ask ourselves, how do these things actually work? So roughly in outline, um, let's think about two contact records and look at each field of the rule. And is that field the same in both contacts? If it is, we add the, the weight value to the, to the overall score and we repeat that for the next field. Once we get to the end of those that list of fields that are in the rule, we've got a total score. And then if that score is uh, over the threshold, then those records are deemed to match. Now, of course, whether they truly represent a duplicate is another question. But according to the digit rule that we've specified, then those things match. So what's that length thing I talked about? Well, it, normally we are matching on the whole field. But if we specify a length, then we're saying, just look at the first few characters of that field and do the comparison based on that. So uh, just supposing we had a record for a William and a Will, then if we just specify first name, uh, as, as our field with no length given, then those are not going to match. But if we specify a length of three, then both of those get truncated to WIL and, and those do match. So if you have uh, those, those sort of shortened names, uh, then that's one way of trying to find them. Um, it's, it's somewhat imperfect in that you have to guess quite how many letters you're going to look at and which ones um, are you know how, how many letters you're going to match on um, and it's only going to work where the name is is just a shortened version as opposed to alternative so William is or Will is not going to match Bill <clears throat> you need more sophisticated matching if you want to do that kind of thing um, and that's not within these digit rules 
So that's the length aspect to it. Um, and the weight? Well, as we saw earlier, uh, that weight is it is just a um, just a number, and the only real significance is in terms of its relationship to the other weights and to the threshold overall. So when we, we add up um, each of those fields that do match and the weight of those, then uh, we, we're just looking at how that compares to the threshold. So a simple rule, we might have two fields, each with a weight of 5 and a threshold of 10 overall. And so that means we need both fields to match in order to score those 10 points <clears throat> uh, and therefore meet our threshold. But we can do something slightly more fancy if we like. So we can do effectively an OR here. Um, so we can say there are two fields, each of weight five, but with a threshold of five, then in order to, to reach that score of five, all we need is for either one of those fields to match, and then we meet the five. Um, and if we get both, great, that's a bonus. But this is, it's simply, you know, does it, uh, does it match or not? Now, I should say in terms of, uh, of these weights, um, uh, there's no, it, it, so, so we could just as well have said um, each field has a weight of one and we have a threshold. Um, so for the first example, uh, each has a weight of one and a threshold of two. Um, whether we use one, whether we use five, ten, really doesn't matter. Um, it's just in terms of adding up those scores and how does it relate to the threshold value that we've defined overall. So, Here's a bit of a test. Um, let's say we configure a rule like this with a last name and a weight of 10, a first name weight of 5, a first name length 1 weight of 3, postcode weight 4, with an overall threshold of 15. Now, anybody feeling really brave and wants to turn their mic on and have a guess at describing in words what this is going to pick up for us? Okay. Shall I try again? <laughs> I think in order to get to 15, so you'd have to have the last name, and then you'd either have the first name matching completely, or you could have the first name matching the first three letters and the postcode matching. Right. So it's... It, uh, on that first name is the first one because it's length of one um, but then the weight of three yeah so it's exactly so in order to reach the 15 we have to uh, the, the the scores on offer here we've got a 10 a 5 a 3 and a 4 so it's how can we get to 15 from those and it, so yeah we need the we need the 10 otherwise we're not going to get there so we need a last name to match and then either as a first name, or it's the initial and the postcode to get a, a three and a four. So that gives a threshold of 15. Does that make sense? Does anybody want to ask a question about that one? So, so um, when you've got, you've got two first names, uh, items there, haven't you? Uh, first name weight five, first name length one weight three. <clears throat> so you, you can just put them, you can list them like that. You don't have to put or in, in explicitly do an or thing in, in the logic. That's right. There's no explicit or. It's, okay. it's just how, um, <clears throat> which of, what combination of those things can you can you get a 15 from? Or oh, more than 15, yeah. Okay, cheers. Okay, so 
if the threshold was 14, any offers other than William um, for how for, for what that would require? Well, I can answer that one if you want me to. It, it would be, if, you want, if you're going to change the threshold to 14, the last name and the postcode would give you 14. It would. So as long as the last name and the postcode matched, it would say, "Yep, they're they're a they're a match and dupe it," which is a little bit risky on that one. It, indeed, and you wouldn't necessarily want to use that because you know if you've got a couple, then chances are high that the last name and postcode are going to match. So this is again one of those where just because you can construct a rule that produces this doesn't actually mean that it's a good rule uh, or one that is actually useful. But if you're so if you're doing this as a as a trawl through your database, then you might want to look at that. Um, but if if you certainly won't want that just as a uh, as an unsupervised rule. Okay, great. Uh, so that's the, the weight bit. So I kind of touched on this, but what fields are good in a rule? Um, and yeah, that's a picture of fields, just in case you're wondering. Um, okay, any offers? What fields are going to be useful in, um, in a rule that we're creating here? Just throw out a few ideas. Email. Mm -hmm. First name, surname, postcode. Yep. Could also use mobile phone number. Yep. One more. Okay, so I think one of the, the, the sort of real starting point on this is it has to be a field that you use. So <clears throat> mobile phone number, for example, good one um, if you're collecting it, but if you don't collect mobile phone numbers, it's useless. So it's got to be something you're actually using. And that kind of seems obvious, but when we think about this in terms of a form that we're submitting, then the only data that it's got to work with is what you've got on that form. And so if in all your forms that you were doing, you're including a, um, a mobile number, then that could be useful. But if you only got that on one or two forms and the rest of them maybe just want an email address or something to sign up to a newsletter, then that's not, it's not going to catch um, as much as, as you might have hoped. So it's not just about the fields that you're using over on the system, but it's what are you using within the, the forms that you have available. Now, Council <clears throat> um, mentioned a useful point here in the comments, uh, in the chat, which is to say that on Drupal, if you're using web forms, you can specify uh, the, the particular DGIT rule that you want to use for that web form. And that's quite a nice feature because it means that you can have uh, digit rules that, that work specifically for, for that form based on the fields you're looking at there, rather than needing to try and come up with something that works more generally across all of your forms. Um, so that's, that's quite a nice feature of web forms and, and I think that can be usefully brought into other forms of CIVI, but don't think it is yet. So obviously if you have unique fields, um, uh, sorry for the non-UK people. That's a national insurance number or a um, health service, national health service number. And um, so, if you have those sorts of things, then by all means you can use them, and they're unique. And you know, if the NI or the NHS number matches, you're very sure that that is the right person. That this is the same person that we're talking about. Um, but you probably don't have those. So then we come down to, if you like, more sort of high specificity fields. So things like a date of birth um, can, can be quite, quite good if you've, again, if you're capturing that uh, or a postcode. Um, but generally, 
we come back to it's it's a combination of different things so it's a first it's a last and a postcode and if all those things match that's great um, but even then when could that fail somebody want to yell out um, a possibility where that might that wouldn't work for us anyone father and son same names oh yeah father and son same names same exactly address <clears throat> yeah nice one parent and, so, parent and child let's uh, not let be sexist <laughs> <laughs> so so if we, you know and um, and this is again going to come down to to some extent who's who's in your system so uh from a from a uk perspective you know we don't tend to go so much for you know john smith the fourth and john smith the fifth kind of thing um whereas in a u.s context that seems a, a more popular if less imaginative thing to do um and so to have that same name uh that, that gets repeated and if they're living in the same place which is possible uh then the postcode is not sufficient so then you might, might want to also include um the the last name suffix <clears throat> in, in there as well if you were trying to do that sort of thing but that depends again to some extent in terms of knowing knowing your data and knowing you know um quite what you're asking on forms the other thing of course is if you don't actually ask for the postcode then you're not going to be able to match on it and to so say it can be difficult to construct good rules that work with all your forms and um, and coming back to the, the warning that we heard earlier in terms of saying, you know, do have to be, um, you, you're probably better letting in some dupes and then finding them and, um, and, and correcting those and merging them manually rather than trying to get too, too sophisticated in terms of your, um, your matching rules as they come sort of into the system through forms. Um, should also point out we, we said there were three kind of typical places where where they um duplicates arise from so one was the forms but the other was from imports and if you don't import through the um uh, through those those civi screens one of the options there again is to specify duplicate handling and which dedupe rule you should be looking at um now deduping on imports is a whole you know another aspect to it because of a number of different options you can do there but just be aware that you can specify the DG rule there and it's something that we can uh maybe gloss over a bit and go um, yeah whatever um it suggested something and just use it you probably do actually want to look at that and make sure that it's it's doing something sensible for the data that you're importing okay so talking of that DG process, <clears throat> how do we run it? Um, we go to the contacts and the find most duplicate contact. Um, we select a rule to use, we search, and then we choose what to merge. So remember, just because the rule has shown up a match here doesn't mean they actually represent the same real person. So that's where the choice comes in. Um, but we choose what to merge and go. So enough of PowerPointy stuff, um, demo time. But first, just to point out, um, there is some documentation uh, in the user guide under the common workflows section, all about deduping and merging, which tells you all about that. Uh, there is another, uh, there's an extension. Um, so, if for the likes of, of Wikimedia, when you're dealing with you know, whatever it is, millions of contacts, um, the standard DG rules and so on within CIVI don't necessarily provide enough flexibility. Um, and so Eileen's got this DGPA um, extension, which provides a bunch of extra features and functionality and so on. Um, and so if you're kind of running into the limits of, of what you can do effectively on the default stuff, then certainly go have a look at that.
Okay. So uh, let me attempt to switch across to a screen here. Good. Are you seeing a CV screen saying find a merge contacts? Yep, I can see that. Yep. Good. Uh, and is it readable? We bump it up slightly. What's that? Yep. Okay. So what we've done here uh, is just come for the contacts, find a merge duplicate contact, and <coughs> This here is the default setup of things that we get. Uh, and in this system, I pulled in uh, a bunch of generated data with a bunch of um, similar looking names and addresses and whatnot, uh, so that we can see quite how some of these things work. So you see, we've got these, uh, these three uh, rules that come in the system by default, which are reserved. Uh, so remember I talked earlier on about the unsupervised rule being just based on email and um, you know, for a lot of situations that's it's not a bad default but it's also not necessarily what you actually want to use so you might want to check what what you actually want to use for your system for an unsupervised rule um, so if we say use one of these uh, so we're going to say name and address. Let's try it. <coughs> Excuse me. Using this. So here we can select the group of contacts. If if so, uh, this for example is useful if you have um, imported a bunch of contacts and you've added those all to a group and you're wanting to see whether there's any um, any duplicates but just relating to that group rather than everything in the system, uh, then you can do that here. We're just going to use the whole thing. And so it then goes ahead and um, spits out this list of things. So you see it's telling us we've got, this is the first 10 entries of 87 and potential duplicates overall, which is based on, well, name and address. Now it doesn't exactly define which field it's looking at for name and address. Uh, and I think you have to go and look at the code to actually figure that out. So I say I don't tend to rely much on those uh, default reserved ones. Uh, I tend to prefer putting in you know, the actual details uh, and fields that I'm interested in, in seeing and using depending on the situation. But nevertheless, just to go through the different bits of the screen here. So one of the, the, the newer pieces is this filter contacts bit. So we've got this bunch of results back. If in here I were to clear, start specifying, let's say, I don't know, then only those with Helena in this first contact are going to show up. So it just limits down what we're looking at. Um, this is just in terms of the view of things here. Uh, Similarly, if we wanted to, uh, say, limit it to a particular postcode, um, now we, we can't really see what's gone on there, but we can see we've dropped down to uh, 43 entries uh, using this A1 code. <clears throat> we've also got uh, some options here to show additional columns within here, so we can pop in the street address, postcode if we want um, and that's yeah can be useful just in terms of, of um, again if you know your data um, or just seeing quite what's going on can be useful there um, threshold gives us the threshold score now for this reserved rule because we don't know how it's constructed that doesn't tell us that much so we'll come back and look at that in a minute when we define our own rules. Um, <clears throat> so from here, 
we could select say those and then we could do a batch merge of those particular duplicates <clears throat> or we've got this one of merge all duplicates and when we do these batch merges it does something called a safe merge which basically means if there is no conflicting bits of data then it will put them together so if it um, so if one record has an address and the second one doesn't have an address then it will say okay there's not a conflict there they're not the same but there's not a conflict um, and so therefore we can merge those together um, <clears throat> if there are fields that don't uh, that, that, that where there is a conflict then those won't get uh, those records won't get merged um, so you can do that but uh, once again, when you're doing this batch merge of all, do do be very conscious of what the rule is you have used to search uh, and therefore to come up with this list. So um, here we've searched on uh, the name and the address. And so that's probably quite good. Um, <clears throat> and a batch merge of that is relatively safe. Alternatively, we can come to the merge of an individual record and you'll see down here, uh, again, just quick orientation around, we've got, so we can merge this um, based on what we said down below here, and we can merge and go onto a listing, view the result and so on. Um, but here we've got the two contacts and uh, so we've got these two we can see when they're created modified and the various bits of data now this is the default um, Greenwich theme that we're using here and this quite nicely shows all these matching ones as being in green uh, so here they're the same so it doesn't give you any option um, down here uh, you can uh, copy across these addresses so for example if you didn't want that as the home address you could bring that across as say main or whatever again depends what uh, which locations you're using within your system as to where you want those addresses but nevertheless you do you click what you want on here um, and then we can just let's merge that and view the result and what we're going to see is a single merge record nothing particularly spectacular there okay let's try adding a rule so we'll do a quick and simple rule um, and <clears throat> um, normally you're going to want to create this as a general rule for a start uh, once you're sure that it actually does what you want and picks up the right things then you might want to switch it across to the, uh, the um, unsupervised so let's do a last name first name five five ten save that shows here and then we can use that rule And then, yes, <clears throat> it's easy where the, the first and last match exactly. Uh, but if we pull in, so you see some of these, because uh, a whole jumble of, of records that I've created in here. Uh, and so some of them here, those, uh, those don't match. So what we'll do, given this rule, uh, let's select these 10 here and we'll batch merge these ones and let's see what happens so we're checking through our 10 pairs that we selected and seeing what happens and it tells us that seven were merged and three were skipped now note down here 
uh, we've got the conflicts box here. And so this is showing us that the address details were different and the email address was different. Um, so there wasn't a conflict in the data for the other seven. Those were merged quite happily. Um, and then these were, were not. So from this point, we're going to need to decide, you know, is this actually the same person who's moved or are they two distinct people? They just happen to have the same name. Um, and how you do that, again, the you know, Civi can't necessarily give you all the answers here. Um, it may be a matter of, of you knowing some of the people uh, <clears throat> and taking you know, sensible decisions based on, on what you know from other situations. Um, you may decide you want to uh, bring these together, but with a kind of a secondary address, it's possible. Uh, so if one, say, was a home address, one was a work address, then you go, ah, yeah, okay, yes, they conflict, but <clears throat> we do want to bring those together, um, etc. Okay. And so then a lot of it really comes through in terms of, of deciding quite what you want to do in your rule um, and so on. And we've looked at a few other examples in the notes uh, as we went through. So... Um, I think that might be time to see where we've got into in terms of questions and what um, what people want to ask. So, William, do you want to kind of do whatever? <laughs> okay, so we've got a few questions. Shall I read these out for you, Aidan? Yeah, uh, yeah, sure. I haven't looked at the questions too much. So one of them is, how do you use rules to avoid duplication? I think you've answered that already, but if whoever um, wrote that question, if you feel that there's something else you need answered, then please speak up now. OK, well, let me just talk slightly more on that. But then yeah. uh, so to say, uh, one thing I should have pointed out is these help icons, uh, some of them are really useful. Um, and they're always left going, yes, yeah, so what, what's this supervised and unsupervised and which way around are they and so on. And, and this tells you, um, and it tells you where they're used. So the unsupervised rule um, through online registrations, event memberships, contributions, etc., um, And these have a pretty narrow definition of what's a duplicate, as in we want to be very sure that it really is the same person if we're going to automatically take this new bunch of data and combine it with existing data. Uh, and so the, it's a matter of, of creating a rule and then marking it as the unsupervised rule. You can only have one unsupervised rule. So uh, let's Let's say um, if on this first last, um, I tell you what, let's add in a postcode there just so we don't feel quite as sort of, you know, vulnerable. Uh, we'll call that a 15. Um, again, as we talked about, this isn't great. If you've got people with the same person last name, yeah, parents and child type situation, but excluding that one for the moment, and we said that was then the unsupervised rule. When we come back to this page, you'll see that that is now the unsupervised rule. So that's the one that's going to get used when we do a contribution form or a membership or whatever. Um, if it needs to come through here, bear in mind, of course, we talked about using um, getting people to sign in first and to uh, or to um, use the contact hashes um, in the, the checksum links in the mails as those go out. If you're going through that, you're not dependent on these digit rules at all. But where you've got anonymous data and um, people filling in forms without logging in, then it's this unsupervised rule that is going to be uh, applied to determine whether or not it's going to update existing data or create a new one. Does that cover the question? Yes, great. I hope so. 
Um, so there was another rule which I think you just touched on there, but it's what the difference between supervised, unsupervised and general rules are. Okay, <clears throat> so general don't get used automatically. Uh, they're only used when you come through this sort of screen here and you go use the rule. Except uh, you can choose them, as we said, when you do an import. Uh, just let me show that for a moment. Uh, import contacts. Uh, so down here, you get to choose your DJ rule, and that can be any of those. Um, <clears throat> and you also have quite how those duplicates are handled. But uh, this is where you are selecting which rule to use. So that can be a general one in there. Um, and then similarly with web forms, you can choose which rule you're applying. But unless you select it somewhere, the general ones aren't going to get used. Uh, so it's the unsupervised one that gets used for forms. And the supervised, again, coming back to our little help box here, tells us. Um, so when we create a contact through the interface, then there's a little option there to, um, to check whether or not it's a duplicate. So just to demonstrate that one. We come here <clears throat> and if we fill in some blurb and we do a check for matching contacts. Uh, so let me just come back here. Find the name that was in here. Oh no, we had a we had a Helen, didn't we? So if I start So you see, <clears throat> as soon as I put that in, it's coming up with some automatic things here. Um, so here it's found one, but also we can do this check for matching contacts. Uh, and I think there is not 100% sure, uh, because I think this here, check for matching contacts, is what uses that unsupervised rule. And there's some other magic that's going on here. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what that's based on. I think that's not specific to, um, to the DG rules. Not 100% sure on that bit. Uh, but you do get these coming up here and then we can do the matching contact here. Um, and using our default supervised rule, it didn't find anything for Helena White. Um, and our supervised was name and email. Okay. And a related question is, what are the household rules? So you've got different types of rules on that page. Yeah, true. <clears throat> so if you, uh, so going back, uh, in Civi, you've got these three basic types of contacts of individuals, households, and organizations. And um, a lot of people don't use households at all, but basically that's where you've got um, it's, it's kind of family in terms of, of looking at saying these are the people who are living at, at a common address. Um, and some setups make, make heavy use of these, others don't, but a lot of people don't use them at all. Um, but when you do this, uh, this DG merging process, you're selecting, um, you know, whether you're looking at households or individuals or organizations. So, um, and you see by default here, they've decided to use name and email as both the supervised and unsupervised. Um, whereas for individuals, before we changed it, we were just using email rather than name as well. So. Okay, there's one more question which relates to your example. You had, so your rule was first name and last name the custom rule that you created, um, but the conflicts were on the address. So the question is, will all fields be checked for conflicts? Right, <clears throat> good point. So the rule itself is looking to say which bits match. And <clears throat> those that get in this list here, and I think we said it was, uh, was this name and email we're looking at? 
No, not email. Sorry. I'm not which rule we're looking at here. It was first and last name. First and last. Thank you. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> so we're just looking at first and last. So the, uh, the rule is looking at first and last to determine um, which ones show up in this list here. So we've got 139 possible entries. Um, and but when we come to do the merge itself, if we were to batch merge these, then yes, it's looking at all the fields in the record, not just uh, n not just the ones in the in the rule. So the rule kind of gets you like the candidates, which are here. But when we come to do the batch merge, that's looking at everything and saying, is there a conflict? Great, thanks, Aidan. Um, I think that's all the questions, unless I've missed anything. Were there any more questions from anyone? Okay, in which case I suggest, Kath, would you mind turning off the recording now? <laughs>